Dear listeners, welcome to the Historia podcast. In this episode, we had, as a special guest, the renowned historian, Professor Sir Richard Evans. We talked with him about his biography of Eric Hobsbawm, his inquiry in Nazi conspiracy theories, and we also reflected with him on the dangers the study of history faces today. At the end, we asked him several of your own scented questions. We hope you have a great time listening. Enjoy! Uh, but first, a simple question to start off with. Um, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. And, but I'm very well. Um, I've managed to uh, escape the COVID. And uh, although I've, I've been doing things like going to the theatre and concerts and speaking events and that kind of thing. So I'm careful. I, I wear a mask on the tube in London. Uh, almost the only person left who does this now in England. All everything has been scrapped. You know, there's no precautions at all. Uh, but so far, so good. I mean, I'm in a country house in uh, an old Victorian farmhouse in North Hertfordshire, with a lovely view across the valley to the woods beyond and, and the hill. Take my dog for a walk every day, and uh, otherwise, I'm writing. I've done some TV programs recently. I'm fine. In other words, thank you for asking. In 2019, you released a biography on Eric Hobsbawm. He, of course, being a famous social historian, Hobsbawm's work is considered monumental in modern historiography due to his contributions in the field of history from below. The biography, however, focuses on who he was as an individual. So what was he like as a person? Well, I've never described myself as a social historian. Like Hobsbawm, I don't really believe in these artificial distinctions between political history, social history, economic history, and so on. He only became a member of the Economic History Society and published in the Economic History Review in the 50s because mainstream history was almost all political history and would not really accept the kind of way he did history. But uh, since then, of course, everything has changed. As far as Hobsbawm is concerned, well, of course, he wrote an autobiography called Interesting Times after a supposed Chinese proverb that, in fact, turned out to be a fake one, um, uh, the curse, may you live in interesting times. But it's a very impersonal kind of book. You don't get much of a feeling for how, what kind of person the man was. I knew him slightly over quite a long time period. I guess I first met him in the 90, early 1990s. How it happened was that the British Academy, of which he was a fellow and I'm a fellow, always gives you, gives when you die, you give you get a, what they call a biographical memoir, which is a an obituary, but they're quite long uh, and quite well researched. They appear in the pub, in the proceedings of the British Academy, which means about five people read them. But uh, a lot of these are very well researched. So when he died and the Academy asked me to write his biographical memoir, uh, I went to his house in Hampstead, as I know, knew and know his widow, Marlena, and um, I found the whole of the top floor was completely covered in papers, letters, diaries, unpublished books, even um, files, uh, folders, boxes. I mean, amazing. He never threw anything away. And, when I started reading through this stuff, I realized pretty pretty soon there was enough there for a biography. And the great British historian A.G.P. Taylor once said, biography is not history, but every historian should try it once. Uh, so this is my go at it. I thought the material was too rich, uh, and he was such a wonderful writer, uh, to ignore. So... Um, I got the permission of the family and the, his literary executors, uh, his agents, the publishers, everybody, to um, go ahead. And I had no restrictions at all. And of course, I discovered, I, I, I like to think I discovered what the man was really like. So what was he like? Well, first of all, he had an astonishingly broad and precise knowledge. He was described as an undergraduate student in Cambridge in the late 30s as uh, a freshman, as his first year, as a freshman who knows everything. His knowledge of history, of politics, of people, places was vast. He 
had an emotional life. He presented a kind of persona which was rather cerebral, uh, rather Olympian. But underneath it all, he, uh, I discovered from his diaries uh, that he was uh, could feel upset. He, commit, he, he uh, contemplated committing suicide when his first wife announced, uh, well, kicked him out of their home in London. It was a wartime, wartime marriage. And like so many, as soon as they had to live together after the war, it started going badly wrong. They're rather bizarrely um, and comically. He wasn't worried about the fact that she'd taken a lover. He was worried about the fact he wasn't a communist. Uh, and and uh, but it was only when she told him that he was no good in bed uh, and their time, that, and he, she was having much better sex with this non-communist man, not that their two things were connected, that he really had a nervous breakdown. It really was very serious. And he kept a diary during that period. And, uh, it was an astonishing document. He was a wonderful writer from the literary background of his, his mother, I think, and also the fact that as he records in his teenage diaries, he read extremely widely and intensively in English literature as well as French and German literature. And I think that that paid off in his historical writings later on. Uh, I discovered that he didn't think of himself as his historian uh, until after World War II and, and fell into history a bit by accident, really, just because he happened to be very good at it. He was a Marxist. He, he came to history through Marxism and not, not the other way around, as it were. But he, he left the party, as it were, spiritually uh, and politically, and at that point, he stopped writing about the rise of wage labor and started writing about alternative, marginal people, millenarians, bandits, revolutionaries, what he called primitive rebels, the title of his first book. Nevertheless, that dovetailed with his divorce in 1953. And he, uh, when he moved from Cambridge to London and had to um, support himself with a lectureship, didn't have free board and lodging in Cambridge College where he was before. He, uh, he knew a lot about jazz through his cousin, Dennis Preston, who was a jazz, and um, he got a job as a jazz critic, and that meant that he was teaching in an evening school at Birkbeck, and after teaching at nine in the evening, he'd go off to Soho to the clubs. So that's where he moved. He wrote a fantastic article about strip clubs, for example, um, it's kind of a piece of classic piece of social investigation. He interviews the girls, interviews the managers, and he had an affair with a part-time sex worker. And so all of this is completely unexpected side. Um, I found that very interesting, and it's interesting to think about the fit between the historian's personal life, the historian's political beliefs, and the historian's kind of historical writing. That's really the centre of my biography. Uh, why is it important to study the historian behind the work? Well, that's famous, of course. <coughs> Famously said by Ted Carr, E.H. Carr, first uh, first study the historian and then, then read the books. And I think that explains why he wrote what he wrote. It doesn't, of course, explain the work itself in term, its own terms. You have to tackle his books in their own terms. You have to look at the kind of theories which they embody, the kind of style he wrote in, the subjects he did. But it always helps to understand, to know where somebody comes from. And above all, I think, actually, what really impressed me, you can tell us from the books, but what I didn't expect to find was masses of wonderfully well-written, beautifully written essays, short stories, the diaries themselves, enormous range of writings completely unknown. So the book is so long because... Uh, I, I use it to allow him to speak for himself in all of these different ways. The only thing he wrote really badly was poetry. He wrote quite a bit of poetry as a teenager and in his early 20s, and it was truly terrible. It really was bad. Uh, I started by quoting bits of it, and in the end, as I revised the book, I cut those bits down and down as far as I could. What to you is the most important lesson we can learn from Hobsbawm or his work? <laughs> well, I, I think we can, I mean, he was, I think, perhaps still is, the, best, the world's best-selling, most widely read historian. And I think you, you need to think as a historian about how to 
communicate with as wide a public as you can. He's not the only historian to do that. He, Trevor Roper, for example, who was the Regis Professor of History when I was a student at Oxford, he wrote a wonderful set of instructions to PhD students uh, in which he said, do not just address your work to the examiners. Write a PhD as if you're writing for a wide audience. Make a, And Hobsbawm is the same. He used to tell his PhD students, don't imagine that a PhD has to be boring. <laughs> Make it interesting. Of course, it has to be scholarly. It has to show that you know how to research and so on. But uh, do everything you can to communicate, particularly in straightforward language, I think. It doesn't have to be simple, but it has to be comprehensible. Don't use jargon, uh, for example. Try not to use overly technical terms. It's very often not necessary. I've, I've read historians who say, well, the point of history is to make everything more complicated. And I couldn't disagree more strongly. The, uh, the real art of history is to take really complicated historical subjects and make them easily comprehensible, help your readers to understand them. So that, I think that is very, very important. We're moving on to the next subject. Okay. So another recent publication of yours is a book on conspiracy theories around Hitler and the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. And this book uh, takes five popular claims involving Hitler and the Nazis and uh, scrutinizes them. Uh, could you perhaps highlight one of these five cases? Well, I want to start by saying, History, one of the things Holmesholm says, which is uh, true in my own case, is that you don't plan your career. You don't really plan what you, uh, what you want to research on. It's kind of instinctive that, you, that something makes something interesting to you and you find other things not interesting. That's one of the clues to the fact that his interests as an historian were driven by personal beliefs and, and needs. So uh, I've worked on Nazi Germany for a long time now. It's just very important to es establish the facts. I and mean, it sounds very boring uh, and primitive, and you have to ask the right questions, the material, and so on. But in the end, factual accuracy is very important. The past really did happen. Uh, events, you can prove that events happen. Um, you interpret them, that's another matter. But... Uh, we can know pretty definitively about what happened in the past in most cases, except in medieval history, where there's so few sources that they mostly make it up, I think. But maybe you better cut that out of the, the recording. Anyway, so um, uh, I've always been interested in where's the borderline between fact and interpretation? Where's the borderline between fact, or, or if you like, the imaginative the imaginative interpretation of factual material of the evidence and forgery, falsification, and a kind of uh, misinterpretation or distortion. So that's that's driven many of the books, the short books that I've written um, on this geography. I wrote a book about called In Hitler's Shadow. I wrote one about the Irving, the David Irving Holocaust denial case in which I was involved in. Uh, I, I've written one. Uh, about uh, alternative history or what if history. And so it happened sort of by chance, but it, it, but, it, but I was gripped by it. So Cambridge University in, uh, had as a competition for to apply for a big grant from the Leverhulme Trust to study conspiracy theories. And uh, I'd come across some of these in my work on Nazi Germany in particular, conspiracy theory that Hitler escaped the bunker in 1945 and didn't shoot himself. Uh, so uh, with a PhD student of mine, we, we applied for this grant. We got, got it. The, we won the internal competition, applied to the Lieberhim, and we won. Uh, so we had a big project. It's one and a half million pounds, maybe two million euros or so. And we had seven postdocs, po uh, postdoctoral fellows. We had researching all kinds of conspiracies, conspiracy theories. We had... I had two co-investigators. It went on for five and a half years. And my contribution was to look at these conspiracy theories. And I also should say, I was head of a Cambridge college as well as being a professor and teaching. And I desperately needed time, time off to work. So, and this gave me a year to free myself from teaching. So I, uh, I looked into the business, all of these extraordinary theories and you find them very widespread. Uh, I mean, there's a, 
a 24-part TV series called Hunting Hitler, in which uh, several intrepid investigators go and try and find traces of Hitler in South America and claim that they found them, though they haven't at all. It's all speculation. And I was just fascinated by why do people do this? Why do people seem to believe that Hitler escaped? And I sort of came to the conclusion that, well, quite a lot of them are admirers of Hitler and cannot believe that he died a squalid death. He must somehow fool the Allies uh, into believing that, that he, he, he was dead and then made his escape. So, and if you look at the evidence, of course, it, it's either speculation, invention, above all, it's denial of the actual evidence and refusal to contemplate it. And when we began the, uh, you know, they just, they just make up their own evidence or focus on side issues rather than confronting the reports of Hitler's valet and his adjutant, uh, Linger and Günther, or the conclusions of the investigative reports at the time. When we began this project, it was kind of academic thing, really. And then along came President Trump, and suddenly conspiracy theories, theories moved right into the center of international attention. And we found ourselves with our website uh, and our seminars and lectures really moving into the mainstream of social science investigations. And of course, now with the conspiracy theories are becoming enormously widespread, particularly in the United States, it became very exciting in many, many different ways. And I put together a book from five case studies. Uh, which uh, was published two years ago now. Okay, so conspiracy theories are, of course, everywhere nowadays, so it yeah. seems. Um, yeah. Can we learn from these past examples in studying or countering current conspiracy theories? Well, I hope so. I mean, I hope we can... The, the, I, I wrote the book, you know, partly because it's just fun to look at these crazy conspiracy theories and slightly more seriously how they're put together, what kind of rules of evidence the conspiracy theorists use. I mean, they join up the dots in ways that no sensible objective historian would do, but what do they regard as evidence? What motivates them? And I think in, uh, and how do their theories spread? How do they get disseminated? And that, I think, is a, uh, th we can learn about that. We have to learn all my life I've been trying to uphold the idea of truth and the possibility of discovering the truth against many different kinds of doubters, as it were, from post-structuralist uh, linguistic theorists to communists to the far right to and now to conspiracy theorists. And uh, what is new, of course, is the internet, social media. It's astonishing to think how new they are. And we're not, we're talking less than two decades, really. And every time you get, an, uh, you get a, a kind of revolution in communication, it allows conspiracy theories to spread faster and further. So when you get printing, for example, in the, 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 the late 15th, 16th centuries, uh, that allows conspiracy theories to spread. Then you get radio, uh, you get TV, film, you get, um, and, and finally you get, uh, well, well, probably won't be finally, but, uh, you get then the internet and the social media. Uh, and we need to think of ways of dealing with this, which is very difficult because you don't want to engage in censorship. But on the other hand, you have to have, find some way of controlling or curbing these things. Uh, I don't think the um, social media companies have yet fully grasped the issue, though they've made some, some step, taken some steps. I think. So we've talked about conspiracy theories. We're going to move on to the next topic, the use and misuse of history today. Conspiracy theories are widespread, but so are other so-called alternative facts. Of course, Holocaust denial. Yeah. That, of course, to you is a known case, um, having been involved in the famous Irving trial. But that yeah. trial today is now almost 10 years ago. But have you personally experienced an increase or rather a decrease in the idea of Holocaust denial? Well, in fact, the trial I was involved in as an expert witness was more than 20 years ago now. And I expect you know the movie where I'm played by an actor who really should have lost weight before he came in front of the camera. So, but, but it's a good movie. It's, it, you learn a lot about the difference between English and American law and a lot about Holocaust denial and a lot about how you prove that something happened in the past, like the Holocaust. When the trial was over in 2000, did succeed in discrediting 
Mr. Irving, and he then really disappeared from the media. So newspapers no longer trusted him or approached him as an expert. He wasn't interviewed on radio or TV. And since he is a man of far-right views, he's still alive. Um, I think that was a, a blow for truth and particularly, of course, for freedom of expression because he wanted to silence Deborah Lipstadt, have the book withdrawn and pulped, and nobody would have been able to accuse Holocaust deniers of falsifying history again. But again, with the spread of conspiracy theories and the spread of, like QAnon, which is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, uh, with the rise of the internet and social media, I think that's put the process into reverse. And so I think Holocaust denial has become more widespread now recently. And there's an additional factor, too, of um, Islamist extremists who propagate Holocaust denial, although for them it's not as central as it was for neo-fascists, because uh, for them, of course, it's designed to discredit Israel, so they have other things by which they is more important to them as ways of discrediting the state of Israel. But if you look, for example, at the obsession of right-wing politicians and authoritarians like Viktor Orban in Hungary with George Soros, um, a Hungarian financier who supports, an American now, that supports um, liberal causes, and the conspiracy theories about him in QAnon and other right-wing networks in the United States, I think anti-Semitism has become more widespread and is more dangerous than than before. And that's slightly, that's slightly depressing with all the work that we put into the uh, into the trial. And you have been known to be critical on laws that outlaw the denial of the Holocaust. Mm. In Belgium, we still have such a law. Why yeah. is such a law dangerous for the study of history? Well, first of all, I believe strongly in freedom of expression. It must have some limits, of course. You can't have incitement to violence or hatred, for example. But governments everywhere are now trying to interfere, and have been for some time, interfere with uh, historical research and historical writing. In the United States, for example, we're seeing currently a move by the Republican Party to censor school history books that deal with issues like slavery or racial discrimination, particularly in the American South. We've seen the Turkish government outlaws. Uh, I mean, in Turkey, you're not allowed to call the massacre of uh, one and a half million Armenians in 1915. You're not allowed to say it's genocide. You can get arrested. And there was, just to point out the absurdity of it all, there was uh, a few years ago a proposal in France to outlaw, to make it illegal to say that the Armenian genocide was not a genocide. So governments like governments increasingly have, re, have have treated history as a way of bolstering national pride and, and and bolstering national consciousness. That means, from their point of view, trying to stop criticism of a nation's past. And I think that is a very dangerous thing for historians and the historical profession. And we are seeing at the moment a a, a large what's called a culture war in the UK. Uh, over the National Trust, for example, a voluntary body which manages uh, hundreds of stately homes and other historic sites in the UK. And it has recently been researching how the money came to the people who built these stately homes in the 18th and 19th centuries. And in many cases, it came from uh, the slave trade or from the ownership of slave-run plantations in the West Indies or indeed from compensation awarded in the 19th century with the abolition of the slave trade, compensation to slave owners, so former slave owners. So, And from my point of view, I think from any historian's point of view, the more you know about the past, the better. Uh, and the more people try to stop you knowing about it, the worse, uh, you know, the worse. So I think we have to combat these things. So, you know, I think, I think we're living in a, a time when the real threat to historical research It comes from governments, and in fact, uh, um, governments everywhere, really. I can't say I know about Belgium, but you don't have a very long history to look back on anyway. Well, if you have a history like Breton's, you know, it goes back to the start of the slave trade in the 16th century. And we really need to know about that. It doesn't mean that, you're, doesn't mean that you, you hate your country when you start doing that kind of research. You can still love your country. Love is not blind, however. It has to be open to knowledge of faults as well as um, virtues.
uh, historians are professionals, right? We know how to investigate the past. We know how to do the research. I would hope that we're guided by some notion of objectivity, even if we have a point of view or a purpose. Uh, we should be guided with by the by the uh, the evidence that the past leaves and covering that up or suppressing it, concealing it as the British Foreign Office did for many years by hiding uh, embarrassing papers uh, about British colonies in East Africa in the 1950s and the campaign against nationalist uh, uprisings, hiding them away somewhere, not allowing historians to have access to them. That's a very bad thing and that's very dangerous. So uh, I think we have a uh, a phrase here about the governments treating institutions like universities or the National Trust or key gardens or other institutions at arm's length. In other words, they might be funded by the government, but they are they 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 are autonomous and they run their own affairs. And there's a what's called a Haldane principle, which comes from um, many decades ago, established by Lord Haldane, a government minister, that although the government funds scientific research, it must not use it to further its own purposes. And that has been breached by the present government in many ways, and I think that is very dangerous. There's a similar controversy in Belgium about the Congo, which has caused a great deal of political argument, but to my mind, King Leopold's crimes in, in the Congo should not be brushed under the carpet. It, it's something that you can draw the contrast with Germany, where I think there has been, by and large, a full and fair uh, confrontation with the National Socialist past. Uh, and that's something of a model. I mean, it's disputed, but there's a majority consciousness, I think. The majority opinion in Germany but it, it supports the, the confrontation with the Nazi past. What you said about the discussion around curricula, it reminds me of a situation here in Belgium. As you may or may not know, our country has a Dutch-speaking part and a French-speaking part. The Flemish government will, starting next year, enroll what they call the Flemish Historical Canon. And it's actually the history of our nation deliberately put in a sort of nationalistic narrative. But of course, it gained a lot of criticism from historians from our faculty and other faculties yeah. because it's teleological to start with. And it would also be obliged, it would be obligatory to use in um, education. So there would be no more universal approach or chance for discussion. So thoughts on that? Well, it's also bad for teachers. You know, teachers need to have a degree of autonomy in how they present the material and how they discuss it with children. And I think the kids at school like more than debating and discussing the past. And there's a tendency on governments to regard history as a kind of pile of facts which you just kind of inject into the students and they'll just accept them all. And that, I think, is the, the route to making history unpopular. Um, must we, to put it bluntly, uh, once again stand in defense of history? Yeah, yeah. And history has to be defended all the time. It's just the nature of his enemies changes. But we have to defend history as best we can against those who would choose to manipulate it, misuse it, or deny it, or suppress it. I'd also say that part of the arguments going on in this country is about uh, removing statues. So there are a lot of statues, mostly from the 19th century, about heroes of the British Empire, as it were, who turn out often to profited from slavery or committed various crimes. And I would say two things. These people, like Lord Clive, for example, Clive of India, were always controversial in their own time. It's not a question of judging the past by the standards of today. Quite the contrary. And secondly... A lot of these statues are put up many, many decades after the people who, to whom they're dedicated. And, and then thirdly, statues in any case are not about the past. It's a misapprehension. Statues are about the present and the future. We put up a statue of somebody because we want to admire this person. We want to look at this person as a model for our own behavior our, our own, and our own values. And so if that behavior and those values change, then I, we need new statues. And you can put the old ones in a museum, I think, with explanatory texts, which is what happened with the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol. The one was originally thrown by a crowd into Bristol Harbour, uh, you may know about, and then a couple of years ago, and then it's been now in a museum. So uh, I think we have to defend history in many, many ways, and the threats against history, as I, as I say, I think the main threat comes from governments. Thank you very much. That is, of course, very interesting 
food of thought and for debate, and we as historians will have to play a role in that today and tomorrow. Traditionally, we like to end our episodes by asking you several questions that were sent in by our listeners beforehand. Um, these are a bit more personal, uh, a bit more lighthearted. Student asks, and we've touched on this, how did you feel about the movie Denial? Did it remain close to the truth? Yes, it did, both to the spirit and the letter of the action. I mean, there's some places where I, I would quarrel with it, so you always have to remember that a movie has to present, that's based on facts, has to present the history in a particular way that's going to interest. So, but it, it's it's good. I mean, it's very well written. I mean, David Hare, who the, is the screenplay and whose idea it was, came to interview me beforehand. And he left my room after a couple of hours and said, well, everybody sees it, I've talked to you, sees it in a different way. Uh, so I thought it's going to be like Kurosawa's Rashomon, you know, but but it wasn't. It was much more straight in its telling. I didn't like the... F I'll just single out two things I disagree with. One was it presented me and my two researchers from the beginning as, you know, we'll get Irving, we'll sort him out kind of thing. wasn't the way it happened at all. We didn't know much about him because his writings are popular history. They're not usable in teaching because they don't have any ideas. You know, they have theories you can discuss and debate. Uh, so we really didn't know what to expect. And half the excitement, the large part of the excitement of doing the research was um, we'd have a meeting every couple of weeks and Nick or Tom's would come, you never brandish in some paper. You never know, you never read, you know, it's unbelievable what he's done here, all the distortions and so on. So... I think that was that was not right. And secondly, I felt very sorry for Robert Young van Pelt, who's the expert on Auschwitz, who test, whose testimony along with mine was at the, the core of the case, because uh, Robert Young came he came off a uh, off a plane from Canada well, a bit too late, so as it were, he was a bit jet lagged, and he was wrong footed. He was ambushed by Irving, who conducted his own cross examination about the holes in the roof of the crematorium. And we, we were all kind of all there in despair as he tied Robert Young up in knots. And in the movie, then that switches to Deborah Lipstadt being very annoyed and saying, well, look, you, you, your tactic of using expert witnesses is not working. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, we have to call witnesses. You have to put me on the stand. And then uh, Anthony Julius is running a case, says, no, 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 just wait, you know. And then I come onto the witness stand and I kind of wipe the floor with Irving and everything is rescued. So I'm a kind of knight on a white horse coming in, which is very nice for me, but very unfair to Robert Young because on the next couple of days when he was in the witness box, he redeemed himself and got over the difficult first day and again really proved his case. So that was one an, a, another point where I thought it was wrong. And finally, I thought, I suppose they felt it was a bit frivolous, but in his closing speech, Irving referred to the judge as Mein Führer. And we were all completely amazed, you know, what the hell is going on? We all burst out laughing and so on. And the judge sort of eventually, you know, he even saw a smile, of course, kind of in his lips. What was it about? Well, I was phoned a couple of days later by a psychiatrist who was working on Freudian slips. And he said, did he really say that? I said, well, I can't hardly believe it, but I think he did, yeah. And he said, yes, he did, because he, he phoned the judge up. He'd been very forthcoming. And um, John said, yes, Irving had muttered an apology to him. So I said, how do you explain it? So the psychiatrist said, well, when Irving was a child, in, born in 1938, and his father had gone away to the war in the Navy, and his mother must have said, your father's going to fight for Mr. Churchill against Hitler. So Irving took this rather badly and conceived a lifelong hatred of Churchill, and Hitler became a kind of substitute father figure, kind of benign father figure. And in the trial, the judge was constantly praising Irving for his knowledge of the law, constantly advising him, he even told him what questions to ask me when I was in the witness box. He was helped, him, went, went out of his way to help him because he did not uh, want Irving to be able to appeal on the grounds he'd been disadvantaged as a litigant in person conducting his own case, whereas Lipstadt had had a very professional libel barrister. And so he confused these two benign authority figures, the judge and Hitler, and, and mixed them up and called the judge my Führer. Um, another one, who is your personal favourite historian? Oh, my personal favourite, dead or alive? Do it has to be alive or will, can I have a dead historian too? 
that is also okay. <laughs> that's okay. All right. That's that's a bigger choice. Well, you know, I mean, I think any historian uh, should read very widely. You should read outside your own subject. Don't I don't just spend all my time reading about Nazi Germany or about German history or European history. My favorite historian, well, I of course Hobsbawm. I also absolutely. I mean, it turned me on to history and showed that I could showed that how you write great narrative history was Stephen Runciman's History of the Crusades, many decades ago. But that's the first big history book that I got. These days, I um, I hugely admire Ian Kershaw. He's now retired, but he wrote a wonderful two-volume biography of Hitler. It was actually my idea. I persuaded him to do it. And also Volker, Volker Ulrich, who's written another another great two-volume biography of Hitler, a German journalist, who is in fact my oldest friend. We were students together in Hamburg in the early in, in the seventies. So I enjoy reading them. I like reading the medieval. Uh, I mean, there's some medieval historians I like. I like a lot. You know, I can't pick out one and say that's the one that I really that I really enjoy. Uh, I'm a judge. I have been a judge for twenty years or more of the Wolfson History Prize. So that means I have to read over a hundred books, around about a hundred books every year in all areas and fields of history. And so I get to read an enormous range of, of, of historians. Last year, we chose, uh, Sudir has a recent book called Black Spartacus, it was on Toussaint Louverture, which I think was a wonderful book. Unfortunately, although we've uh, drawn up a short list for this year. It hasn't been published, so I can't say anything about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the last question for today. Have you ever visited Louvre? No. Sorry. And would you uh, would you ever like to? <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, this it will be great. Um, I think I have been invited. I mean, the problem is these days, I am a, a more pretty much a freelance historian. I live off my pension, my books, and the journalism that I, I write, opinion journalism, and TV programs and so on. So I need pain, I'm afraid I don't, I can't afford to take several days off to travel and give a paper, give a, you know, unless it's promoting a book, a newly published book. But with that qualification, I love traveling, it's become okay. I mean, I actually managed to do a tour last November, promoting the German edition, of the conspiracies book, so uh, but I got paid for every lecture, and that was good. That's an incentive. It's not easy living off a pension. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's okay, but I just have to be careful how I use my time. If you ever order Louvre, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be in Amsterdam. I'm not sure how far it is, but I'll be there uh, in June. Thank you so much for joining us. We okay. really enjoyed it. We found it very interesting. Great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.